The scripture of this morning is from Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12 and verse 16. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star in the east, and we have come to pay homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is shepherd, who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen in the east, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they, gift, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he was infuriated, and he went and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the Magi. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open our hearts, O oh God, to this your word. May we hear with joy what you would have us hear this day, and may the music of your grace build our whole lives long, that we may sing your praise with our whole being. Amen. Well, I'm not sure if you know it or not, but congregations teach pastors. I know that my ecclesiastical title is teaching elder, meaning that part of my vocation is to teach you. But I wonder if you know that you congregation folk teach us pastor people too all the time. <laughs> and I can easily look back on three different congregations I have previously served and sum up what each one of them taught me. My first pastorate taught me how the small day-to-day -day things we pastors say and do can have a lingering of influence. So I always know to tread gently, and when I don't, to apologize. Another congregation taught me the beauty and difficulty of living as a diverse family of faith who is bound and determined to stick together, no matter how messy it gets. And still another congregation taught me the joy of ministry and helped me claim the freedom just to be myself and to let go of any idealized caricatures of what a pastor is supposed to be. And even just after nine months, I already know you have a lot to teach me as well, and I'll try to be open to learning it. Sometimes I will do that well, other times I won't. <laughs> we will just be patient with each other as we go, all of us teaching and all of us learning. But I tell you this because I want to share another lesson one of my congregations taught me on one Christmas Eve. 
I had been at the church for a few years and had journeyed through several Advent and Christmases with them. So I decided it was time to shake things up a bit and try some new things. In particular, I felt nudged to help us all remember that connection between Advent and Lent and Christmas and Easter and the manger and the cross. Now, all through Advent, as we sang the last hymn each Sunday, people brought fabric from their homes up into the chancel and placed them in a manger that we had by the communion table. It was a symbolic way for everyone from the youngest to the oldest to prepare for Jesus' birth. Together, we were making our offerings and getting Jesus' bed ready. By Christmas Eve, the manger was overflowing with colorful fabric and quilt squares, ready and waiting for the arrival of the baby. As I said, we had the manger sitting near the communion table because in that church, we had communion on Christmas Eve. So that year, on Christmas Eve afternoon, the folks from the worship committee came and prepared all of the communion elements and had them ready on the table. And after they left the sanctuary, I snuck in, I took the bread, I wrapped it in a receiving blanket, and I laid it in the manger. Well, no one realized what I had done, and I wanted to keep it that way. It was a moment of liturgical drama. <laughs> and that night, after the carols had been sung and the meditation had been preached and all was ready, I deliberately walked over to the manger as I began to issue the invitation to communion. And taking the loaf into my arms, I began to gently rock it as I would a baby. And as I did so, I noticed some confused looks on people's faces, but they stayed with me. They trusted me. But on this night, their confusion turned to sheer horror as I began reciting the words of institution while unwrapping the bread from the blanket. And then at the pr appropriate time, I lifted it and broke it, and I, I raised the baby turned bread high above my head and broke it. Oh my goodness, I heard audible gasps. That liturgical act proved to have gone, that I went way too far. It was the only time I have ever seen looks of real anger and real disappointment on people's faces during a Christmas Eve service. As someone told me later, Karen, we love you, but breaking the baby was over the top. <laughs> you could have made your point in a different way. Please don't ever do that again. But I must admit, I was a little bit surprised by their reaction. After all, the theological foundation of that act was solid. And the manger is most definitely connected to the cross. That baby Jesus grows up and is killed. And I know that the theology of what I did that night was spot on. And the liturgical drama was unforgettable, if I do say so myself. <laughs> And yet, I have to admit, my congregation had a point. I could have expressed that theological truth in a different way, in a gentler way, in a way that gave them a place to stand and didn't force them into a corner. That congregation taught me, you don't mess with the baby at Christmas. No one wants to think about the baby being broken, especially not on Christmas Eve. There is a time and a place for everything, and apparently that was not it. It is a lesson that I have not forgotten. I tell you all this because no one must have taught that lesson to the, our gospel writer, Matthew. No one must have told him that it was just too much to link the manger to the cross, the baby with the crucified one. 
For while Luke's version of the birth story is the one abounding with colorful details and a babe lying in a manger and angel choirs singing and the shepherds searching, Matthew's version of the birth story and time immediately after is a bit darker, more emotionally ominous. We see it in our reading for today, don't we? Right here in the beginning of chapter 2. And though I originally planned on preaching Epiphany and focusing on the Magi, as I continued my planning for this sermon, I got stuck on that very first phrase in our reading. In the time of King Herod. I got caught in those words, wondering why Matthew was painstakingly pointing out that Jesus' birth happened precisely in the days of King Herod. Perhaps it was to show us, as Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan write, that the shadow of the Roman imperial execution hangs already and immediately over the birth of Jesus. Or to put it another way, the cutthroat politics that led to Jesus' death were amply present at his birth. Now, to understand those cutthroat politics more fully, let's remember just who this King Herod is, or Her he's also called Herod the Great. If we turn to ancient historical writings, in particular from the Jewish historian Josephus, we find all kinds of stories that give us insight into King Herod's character. We learn that King Herod was a jealous ruler who was highly motivated by fear and rage. For example, he executed his favorite wife, his brother-in-law, and three of his sons because he thought that they wanted his crown. That King Herod figured that when the time came that he himself died, the Israelite people would be so glad to be rid of him, both him and his taxes, that they would throw a big party just to spite him. And the king was infuriated by that idea. Therefore, he left an order that on the day of his death, political prisoners throughout the land should all be killed. That way, he guaranteed that everyone would be mourning on the day of his death, and no one would be celebrating. As a little side note, the order was not followed. But that, my friends, is a picture of Herod the Great. He was unarguably a force of evil who did not think twice about destroying anyone who might be a threat to his power, regardless if they were family or friend or foe. It was just the cost of doing business in his mind. If he had to break the baby, so be it. He would do whatever he had to do to be king, to keep his power. And Matthew wanted to make sure that we knew this was the political and historical space into which Jesus, our Savior, our baby king, was born. And once we move through that first phase, phrase of our story for today, we continue to see the danger of Herod's politics of domination. In today's story of the Magi, we watch as Herod raises his national threat level to code red after meeting them and hearing their story. I cannot even imagine the way his blood pressure must have risen when the Magi asked him, where was the child who had been born king of the Jews? King of the Jews, he must have thought. He was the king of the Jews. That is what Rome declared, and that is the way it would be forever. Matthew articulates the emotionally ominous shockwaves of his response by writing, When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him. Following the normal way power works in our world, 
the king responded to his own fear, not with a spirit of openness and courage, but by holding on to that power even more tightly and deciding to do whatever was necessary to keep it. After all, he had killed his own family members in response to this kind of a threat. Breaking a baby would be easy. So when Herod learned later that the Magi had purposefully chosen to avoid him on their way home, he retaliated in a way that was normal for him. He ordered all children two years old and under who lived in or around Bethlehem to be eliminated. And therefore, according to Matthew's gospel, the Christmas season in Bethlehem, the season we still celebrate for five more days, was not a time of silent night or joy to the world, but a time still lived in the days of King Herod, a time of deep grief, heartbreak, and terror. That is the time, Matthew says, into which Jesus was born. That is the time into which God's light came into the world. And from the way that Matthew tells the story, it seems to me he was even more bound and determined than I to make sure that we all remembered the links between Advent and Lent and Christmas and Easter and the manger and the cross. Perhaps he wanted to make sure that even in God's story, the story we claim for our lives at Christmas and in danger or Christmas and pain are really not that far apart. Sometimes they are even part of the same storyline. But why would this be important for Matthew to convey? Why mess up the Christmas story with threat and pain? Was it indeed simply to foreshadow what was to come for Jesus, to offer a hint about the end here in the beginning? Or might it also have been something else that prompted Matthew's decision to include the heartache along with the angel songs? As that question sat in my mind this week, I looked around and hidden amongst the holiday celebrations and vacation days are the victims of the historic blizzard that claimed at least 34 lives in Buffalo, New York. And on the news, I saw the pain of the faces of Ukrainian citizens who have lost so many loved ones in this senseless war with Russia as another rain of missile attacks rained on them last night. And as they try to survive this very, very cold winter without any heat or power. A good friend of mine reached out to me this week to let me know that she lost her brother in an accident this week, and like so many others during this holiday season, is now overwhelmed with grief. And there continue to be escalating tensions in Iran as women fight for freedoms, and in China as people rebel against new COVID restrictions and shutdowns. And then, of course, there's been all the crazy weather, not only here, but all over the country, as people are digging out from blizzards and cleaning up from floods and trying to find a way home again amidst all of the many, many airline cancellations. And there are those we know who are awaiting test results and diagnosis for health concerns. And all of those things held in my heart and being interwoven with the story of Jesus' birth, I began to wonder if perhaps Matthew wrote it this way because he knew that in many ways we still live in the days of King Herod. We still live in that space of already but not yet. When we trust, sometimes we even see and deeply feel that the light has come into the world, yet we also know that the shadows still linger. For many people, for maybe for most people, even though we are still in the season of Christmas and at the beginning of a brand new year, it is still a Christmas born into the days of King Herod, when all is not yet well and we know it. 
It was like that when Jesus was born. It was like that for Matthew's church. And it is like that for us today. So maybe, in addition to foreshadowing what was to come for Jesus, Matthew also just wanted to lift up the reality that so often Christmas and threat or Christmas and pain are not very far apart at all and are sometimes even part of the same storyline and even a part of God's storyline. Perhaps that is why Matthew wrote his story the way he did. He must have felt it would be important for us to see and realize that Christmas, the birth of Jesus, is not just about God coming to be with us in the middle of joyful celebrations. Rather, by inserting in the days of King Herod into Jesus' birth narrative every chance he got, Matthew wanted to make sure that we would see and realize that Christmas is also about God coming into the midst of the worst places, into the most dangerous of times, and into the most painful circumstances of life in order to share in the suffering, to share in the the tragedies, to share in the sorrows with us and beside us. Perhaps by highlighting that Jesus was born in the time of King Herod, Matthew was pointing out the message of Christmas, the message of Emmanuel, God with us. God becoming flesh is not, I have come to save you from suffering and pain, but rather, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. I am with you always, even in the days of King Herod, and I will be with you always when those days are finally over. Matthew wanted to remind us that our baby Savior was born in the time of King Herod and into all of that that, Im that implies. So we might trust that our God has honestly entered into all of it in order to embrace all of it, all of us, with holiness and love and solidarity. Thanks be to God. For if Jesus had not been born into the days of King Herod, into times full of both struggle and joy, sorrow and grief, threat and love, his name, Emmanuel, God with us, might ring hollow. So while I promise you that I won't ever again break the baby on Christmas Eve, I still thank God for all that it means. Lo, I am with you always, even till the end of the age. Perhaps that is a lesson for all of us to learn together. Amen.